All right, so uh, I just got back from a trip up to the University of Minnesota Duluth where I gave this particular lecture. I had a bunch of friends who, who asked me for it. The last few years I've been working on cynicism generally, especially ancient cynicism uh, with Diogenes of Sinope, and that's kind of what this presentation is about. So uh, I started off basically thanking who, who brought me out there. So Alexis Elder, who's a philosopher, she's an Aristotelian like myself. She does a lot of philosophy of technology. I do a little bit of that. And so she was the one who invited me and I really appreciated it. In addition to uh, their department administrator and uh, the department chairs, they, they really helped me get out there and I'm deeply, deeply appreciative for, for having been out there. So thank you to them for this opportunity. And I guess you get to benefit whether or not, I mean, maybe you'll be the judge of that. Uh, for them encouraging me to, to write this particular presentation. So this presentation is, is, is uh, it's got a lot of different parts. And so generally speaking, I wanted to break it down. I'm gonna start to talk about basically the main elements of cynicism. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about Diogenes of Sinope because he's someone that fascinates me. I think he fascinates a lot of people if you judge art history um, and the number of paintings that he's been in. And uh, one of the reasons that I'm fascinated by Diogenes of Sinope is a lot of people really like him or he's been preserved in history, but he also does a lot of very strange things. And yet, whenever we use a lot of philosophy, which has taken a special interest in social vices or bad social traits, the sort of predominant, most popular uh, categories, such as asshole, jerk, sucky person, or a rude person, they just don't seem to apply to him, at least as they're currently defined in the literature. And that's what, uh, that's what motivated this curiosity, this, uh, this particular project. So I, I'm ultimately going to propose that Diogenes of Sinope, and in particular his brand of cynicism, should be seen maybe as something that's fraternal. And uh, that the influence of the cynic in society is more cathartic than toxic. So that's the general outline or that's the general trajectory of what we're going to be talking about. And hopefully it'll make sense by the end. So let's start by talking about ancient cynicism. Ancient cynicism is a school in uh, ancient Greece that's competing with basically the greats, right? Uh, Diogenes of Sinope and the cynics were contemporaries with Aristotle. They were contemporaries with uh, the beginnings of Stoicism, Epicureanism, Skepticism, all that kind of stuff. And their, and their philosophy generally lasted for almost a millennium. There's a lot, of, a lot of interesting stuff going on. But what sets cynicism apart from the other schools is that generally speaking, the primary values that they're trying to go after are self-sufficiency and freedom. And I have the Greek there in the brackets, brackets uh, or the parentheses if you wish to look at that. But generally speaking, the, the cynics want people to live as natural a life as possible. And here natural, you can think animalistic, kind of like my roommate back there, who you can kind of see zero shame about doing what she's doing. The cynics kind of feel the same way. And they want us to live as sort of simply as possible as we would be if we just existed in nature. And that's why self-sufficiency is so important. Self-sufficiency self is something that you develop whenever you're just trying to basically be uh, simple be fundamental, right? The simpler life you lead, the more you pare stuff down, the less you need. And that's kind of what the cynics want. And the less that you have, the more free you can be. I can't just get up and do whatever I want because I have roommate, uh, because I have a house and a lease, uh, because I have a job. All that stuff binds me to where I am. I can't just do what I want to do with my life because I owe certain things to my friends, certain things to my family, certain things to my community. So the cynics, in order to maximize freedom, they really focused on that self-sufficiency. If all you need is to have clothes on your back and maybe some scrap food to eat in your belly and really just a barely a covered spot to live, which we'll kind of talk about, you can basically live however you want. And that's what the cynics aspire toward. The way that you achieve that is through discipline. And so ascesis there is the word that we get asceticism from. And they were uh, practitioners of disciplining both the body and the mind. Very famously, Diogenes of Sinope would train his body for the cold. 
uh, in the fall and the winter by hugging cold statues. He would train his body for the heat by rolling in hot sand. Um, but they were not people that idolized the body, so they only did as much sport or as much physical training as necessary. They weren't like people that were just trying to get jacked or ripped or whatever else it was. The point is to let your body do what it naturally does, right? To, to be the kind of creature that you naturally are, to live maybe more like the dog. And in fact, cynicism is coming from the Greek word kuon, which means dog. They were called dogs, but they kind of claimed it. And I'll, I'll, I'll show a little bit about that. So generally speaking, though, there are some guidelines or there are some aspects to their philosophical system. One is that nature will always trump convention. So again, because they're trying to go after that basic life, the simple life, they are going to point out that a lot of convention, a lot of civilization actually leads us astray. That civilization has convinced me that I need a job or a career, <laughs> that I need a, a house, that I need, you know, a wardrobe, a professional wardrobe, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff, that I need to eat a fancy diet or whatever else. Those things are traps because those things bind me in social relationships. They bind me in, in sort of like ethical things that I don't need to be a part of. And you see this especially in the heroes that they choose to uh, talk about. Uh, the cynics are very famously anti-Promethean. Prometheus is really famous in Greek mythology. He's the titan who stole fire and gave it to the humans. And uh, he, the, the reason why that's so important, and maybe even important for philosophy, is that fire is a symbol for knowledge. But fire also is just this thing that you can use to create tools that you can use to keep yourself warm in any season. It's, it's a really fascinating thing. The cynics, however, thought that Prometheus's gift was actually a curse because rather than it making us better people, we used it to get lazy. We used it to bake cakes. We used it for, you know, climate controlled habitats or whatever. We could have actually lived just as good a life without fire. Instead, they really like Hercules. Hercules is someone who lives a very basic lifestyle. The cynics had a cloak. Hercules had a lion's pelt. The cynics had a staff. Uh, Hercules had a club. Hercules went around slaying monsters to help people out. The cynics see themselves as going around sort of dispelling the rumors that we need power or money or really much of anything to get by whenever we could just be living naturally. So generally speaking, the cynics are not going to be just neutral toward external goods, things like wealth or friendship or reputation. I think the Stoics are kind of like that. They say all you need is, is what's up here. You could be rich or you could be poor, right? It doesn't matter. The cynics are going to say, no, 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 no. It does matter because the more money that you have, the more social entanglements that you have, the less free that you are. So they're outright antagonistic toward external goods. Possessions possess you, power weakens you. You need to stay out of things and you need to be just sort of a natural human animal. That's what the goal is. And you see this also in their philosophy. Their philosophy develops first and foremost ethics, how we should live, the kind of person we should be, how we should operate within our communities. You can kind of like take those as the main aspects of ethics. And everything except for thinking about that is useless. Geometry, logic, music, none of that matters. All that matters is ethics because what we need to be focused foremost on is the kind of people that we should form ourselves into and the kind of lives that we should lead, namely that natural life, uh, that self-sufficient life, that life that preserves our freedom. So um, I'm, I'm going to quote Robert Talese here and I'm going to quote Scott Aiken later. They have a really great YouTube channel, uh, Philosophy 15, where they just kind of have these uh, fun conversations in 15 minutes. That's the whole thing. But I think Rob Talese and, and Scott Aiken characterize the basics of cynicism really well, especially with respect to their politics. And so Talese says this. He says, the core of the cynic philosophical program is the relentless insistence on fixating on the moral failings of everything around you. It is the moral program that says, don't succumb, be at war with everything around you, even the stuff that looks okay, because you've got good inductive reason that the stuff that looks okay is a mere smiley face that you're accustomed to placing on what is in fact irrevocably depraved. 
So what Talise is kind of saying here is that, you know, cynicism is not just a neutral program. It is a program that's going to try to do everything that it can to get you to realize that most of the beliefs that you hold are wrong. And most of those beliefs, especially the stuff that seems okay, are things that you should probably challenge because the fact that you're okay with money, the fact that you're okay with social entanglements, the fact that you're okay with leading anything other than that simple, basic, animalistic life that's really close to nature, that means that you've bought into so many of the lies of civilization and convention. And Aiken takes this point uh, a little bit further and he breaks it down into this, which is uh, what he says. What seems to define cynicism are the denials, the kind of opt-out elements and the disruption elements. Cynics would say something like, I'm not going to participate and I'm going to disrupt. So what Aiken says here, and I think this is accurate, um, cynicism has as part of it, both denial and disruption. You deny that conventions are right and you don't participate. So cynicism is a high integrity, sort of high moral purity, ethical program. You do not participate in life. You do not want to be complicit in sort of the ills of civilization. But not only do you stand out of the way, the cynics kind of see themselves as doctors. They use this metaphor in a lot of their writings. They go where the doctors go where the patients are sick, right? They're trying to help people out by disrupting convention by encouraging people to live that cynic life. So it's a denial. Convention is wrong, but it's also a disruption to try to get people to live that cynic lifestyle. And one of their main ways that they do this is through direct, plain, frank, free speech. Uh, in, in their word, parecia, in case you see this. Michel Foucault made a lot of this particular idea. He's another philosopher. But the cynics kind of like use this idea to go in lots of directions, not just punching up, so to speak, but anywhere, anywhere that they see people making an error of holding convention over nature, they're going to speak out against it and they're going to be as plain as possible to do that. Um, and I think that this is what prevents them from being simple contrarians, simple edgelords, simple trolls. They have a moral message in their thing. It's not just mere contrarianism, although contrarianism is an element, right? They hate convention. So if you're contrary to civilization, you're probably going to end up saying something really important for the cynics. However, because they have that active positive program in mind of being free and being self-sufficient, it, it separates just like mere antagonism with no purpose. Okay. So what did this look like? Now here, I, I apologize for how visually busy these slides are. I, you know, uh, I like graphic design, but I used zero of it in the following slides because I wanted to show some paintings from art history and I wanted to show some of the core elements of, of this, uh, of the cynic program. And so here is a painting called Diogenes by Jean-Léon Jérôme. And you can see Diogenes of Sinope here. He's in his barrel. So he lived in a wine cask. They drank a lot of wine in Greece and that that was his home. He slept in that. Maybe he slept on the occasional porch and you can tell that he has basically nothing. That's that's totally right. So the cynics basically had a costume in the ancient world, a way that you could recognize them. The first thing that they wore was a cloak, sort of a threadbare cloak. When it was hot, they could tie it up and keep it off of them. When it was cold, they could fold it around them. Uh, whenever they went to sleep, they could lay on top of it. The cloak was a tool, but it wasn't that fancy. It was often threadbare, shabby. They also had uh, a pera, which th this word is kind of weird to translate. Um, I'm calling it a bindle. Uh, very often it's called a purse or a pouch or a satchel or something like that. But you can imagine basically a small bag where they had all of their possessions in it. That's it, really. If it can't fit in the pouch, they, that they wouldn't possess it. Um, and then in addition to that, they had the staff. So uh, a walking stick because they walked around all around the ancient world and it's just a useful tool to have. But that costume of the cloak, the bindle, and the staff was kind of their calling card. And you could tell that they were a cynic. 
Uh, you could probably also tell by they just like generally not very well groomed. Uh, probably had a stench to them. <laughs> um, their their you know their beards were not well kempt or anything like that. So the cloak, the bindle, and the staff that was kind of like that that was their thing. And what I think it shows most importantly is a lived commitment to their ideas. They were not a philosophy that said that money didn't matter and power didn't matter and civilization was a trap. And then they went home to their mansions. I think Marcus Aurelius, the emperor of Rome, Seneca, a statesman in Rome who was friends with Nero, uh, th their message seems a little bit weird whenever they say money and power don't matter, these Stoics, right? And then they go back home to their palaces. The Cynics weren't like that. The Cynics, like I said, had a high level of integrity because they would say money didn't matter. And then you would see them eating scraps of food or you would see them living in, in basically a barrel. And they would say uh, social entanglements aren't good. And then you would notice that they didn't really have that many friends. So Diogenes here is characteristically represented around a bunch of dogs. Like I said, cynicism is coming from the Greek word for dog. Uh, but also he antagonized lots of people. So he probably didn't have that many friends. However, dogs loved him. And so there he is. He's hanging out in his barrel. He's with his dogs. Okay, now this painting is Diogenes searching for an honest man, and actually the previous one, Diogenes is fixing a lantern. Here we see him out with the lantern. Diogenes is in the center. And this is a really famous story uh, where Diogenes would go out during the daytime with a lit lantern and saying that he was looking for an anthropos. Anthropos is where we get the word for anthropology. Um, it could mean honest man. That's how it's like translated in a lot of traditional stuff. But I think more accurately, it's probably like he's looking for a real human being. And the implication is whenever he goes around uh, making a display, because it's weird to see this guy in just a loincloth with a staff, uh, with a lit, a lit lantern, and just seeing like, if, if, like are, you, are you a real human being? And then just turn away from you. Just saying no, right? But the idea is he's always trying to get people to realize that basically they could be better. So the cynic life was, was an interesting one because like I said, they, they don't have uh, many friends. They don't have material possessions. And I think ultimately what that means is they need nothing or and they need no one. So this means that they basically have nothing to lose. Uh, this is what allows them to practice parasia, that, that free speech, that frank speech. Because if you're not worried about losing friends, if you're not worried about losing your job, what, if you're not worried about back, what are they going to do? Are they going to take his barrel from him? He'll go find another one or he'll go sleep on the porch. Or are they going to take his possessions? Uh, he can find more scrap beans or something, whatever he has in his little pouch. It's not much. So uh, a lot of cynicism centered around these big acts, these big ways of talking and against anyone. Anytime that they felt like they could tell you the truth that would basically direct you toward living a freer and more self-sufficient life, they were going to do it. Now, part of the curiosity of Diogenes is that some of these antics are really um, wild, abrasive. So, so here's what's going on. So there was a marketplace in, in Athens called the Agora and uh, Diogenes would commit many acts in them. So they had a little bit of a taboo against eating, and so he would eat in public. Uh, they had sexual taboos, and one day, Diogenes, maybe many days, um, was masturbating in public. And people were like, yo, Diogenes, you can't, you can't do that, man. And his reply was, I only wish my belly were as easy to sate by rubbing it. Now, I, I think what the goal of these antics were was to show people that they shouldn't be ashamed of natural functions, right? And this is uh, kind of like talked about in, in many other ways. But the idea is, you know, in the same way that my roommate there, she's not ashamed of licking her crotch. She's not ashamed of eating. She's not ashamed of peeing. Uh, she has to do what she has to do to survive, right? And in the same way, we should be open and not ashamed of natural functions. Um, the very impulses that make us feel ashamed of that natural stuff are exactly what the cynics were trying to argue against. 
Now, they would also do really brash stuff. Like, for example, the party goers aspect here is one time Dodgings was at a party. Some people were making fun of him, calling him a dog, etc. And so whenever he left the party, he went over to them and like a dog, he peed on them. So we don't know exactly. It wasn't described in, in great detail. But I, I kind of imagine that he gets on all four and he lifts up his hind leg and just kind of pees on them and walks out of the party. There's another time whenever uh, someone is talking about Hercules. One of Hercules' labors is he cleans some stables. And so Diogenes takes a dump on the stage. <laughs> you know, the implication being that it wouldn't be shameful to clean up after him if Hercules, uh, part of his great labors was cleaning stables, which, you know, horses poop in the stables. That's part of why you got to clean it, right? And... Uh, a lot of these antics are shocking, or at least I, I would imagine you're shocked by hearing some of that. But again, the whole idea is that there's a moral message behind it. And Julian, who wasn't a cynic, but he kind of defended the cynics. He, he, was, a, he was a Roman emperor. One of the things that he points out is the cynics are shameless whenever it comes to natural functions. And the cynics basically are trying to draw attention that if we should feel shame, we should feel shame with respect to the stuff that we uh, see every day in our public spaces, such as people fighting for power, people fighting to get money, people fighting for romance or whatever else it is. Those things are shameful. What isn't shameful is eating. What isn't shameful is like satisfying basic desires. That is not something you should be ashamed of. And so that's kind of what's going on here. So Diogenes is out here. He's looking for an honest human. He's not finding it. I, I love this painting for, for so many reasons. Uh, just there's so much life in it. There's a little dog. I love the dog. Um, there's the glutton who's laughing haughtily at, at Diogenes. There's these people that are, you know, uh, amused by him. There seems to be one person, he kind of looks like a philosopher, who's actually considering what Diogenes is saying. Uh, but th this expression, this express, I think they nailed it, right? Diogenes looks a little deranged. And in fact, uh, Someone asked Plato what he thought about Diogenes because they're contemporaries. And he says, uh, basically, that Diogenes is Socrates gone mad. Socrates uh, minomenos. So th this is, it's kind of an interesting word to use in, in the Greek because it, it does have the sort of psychological bearing of being out of your mind. But it also has the, bearing, uh, the meaning of like being enraged or infuriated. So just think about kind of like being outside of yourself, being energetic, being kind of like emotionally hot, you're out there. And I think that that's like a really uh, poetic way, but it's also a very important way of talking about what Diogenes was like. Um, but it's also a really interesting phrase in the sense that you're talking about Socrates going mad, but the whole point of Socrates is his intellect. So you're saying it's kind of like an intellectless Socrates. And I would say it's like equivalent to calling someone an ugly Helen of Troy, who's supposed to be the most beautiful woman in Athens, or calling someone a cowardly Achilles. You're kind of taking the defining feature and throwing it aside. So it's meant to be a dig, right? But it's also meant to capture the way in which Diogenes was out there, was doing things that were strange. And in some ways, I, I kind of, and this is like the last part on the slide, I think that the high level of moral integrity, the, the level of commitment that cynics lived toward their own principles is also what makes problem for them being legible or understandable or relatable in certain ways. Because they were living in barrels, because they were begging for their food, because they were challenging almost every single convention, on the one hand, I think people could respect them because they saw that they walked their talk, they practiced what they preached. However, what they what they practiced was was out there and it was wild. And so I think that that's that's captured pretty well in this painting. This is one of the more famous anecdotes. This is a painting called Alexander and Diogenes by Caspar de Creer. And here uh, basically the story is Diogenes was lounging in a garden in Corinth and uh, Alexander the Great is coming through town. That just doesn't happen. He's the emperor uh, of the ancient world at the time. And he's, you know, whenever there's an emperor, and this is something that you probably don't think too much about unless you interact with really high level celebrities or political figures, but there's an entourage. You know, Alexander would have rolled deep, right? He would have had security. He would have had personal assistance. You see that he has horses back there. He has people tending to the horses. 
but it would cause a hubbub, right? In addition to just normal citizens wanting to see what was going on. There was one person though who didn't care and it was Diogenes and he was just hanging out. He was just enjoying the park, lounging in the sun. And so Alexander noticed this and he went over to him. He said, I'm Alexander, the great king. Diogenes said, I am Diogenes, the dog. And Alexander is just fascinated by a Diogenes and just how indifferent he is to everything. And he says, ask of me anything. Basically, Alexander, the most powerful man in the ancient world at the time, just like with money and obviously political power and influence, asked Diogenes, let me, let me, let me, let me do something for you, right? And Diogenes' only reply is, get out of my light, get out of my sun. And I, I find that fascinating. Uh, so everyone found that fascinating, in fact, and they all started laughing and supposedly Alexander went away and said, had I not been Alexander, I would have liked to have been Diogenes. So it seems like Alexander was, uh, was fascinated by it and kind of kept a little bit of a fascination. The story is complicated. They have some interesting interactions through, throughout that have been preserved, but, uh, it, it's, it's fascinating to me for, for a lot of different reasons. And the main reason is there's, it, sh it seems like this, the cynics here are showing an adapt adaptability to their messages. They're understanding who they're talking with. They understand how it's going to get under people's skin. Because listen, we know that Diogenes is capable of much more extreme things. We have the story of him peeing on the party goers. We have the story of him masturbating in public. We have the story of him crapping on the stage, right? Um... But what does he do with Alexander? He doesn't do any of the extreme things. He basically reduces Alexander to a block on his son. Alexander offers him anything in the world. Diogenes says, none of what you could ever offer me would be of any use to me. Money, useless. Power, useless. Just get out of here. To reduce an emperor to a few words in reply and just to say, please leave, is probably something that got under Alexander's skin better than the brash stuff. So the cynics provoke and they provoke, like I think, or like I said, with the positive values in mind, but they also adapt that message. And this is gonna be really important to later points in uh, the lecture. This is an inset of a very famous painting called The School of Athens by Raphael. And uh, if, if, you, if you look at it, it's just kind of fascinating, especially if you know a lot about philosophy. In the center are Plato and Aristotle. They're very much the visual center of the painting. Plato pointing to the heavens, Aristotle pointing outward. Uh, and their teacher, Socrates, he's not talking with anyone except for normal people, which I, I think that's, that's pretty interesting. But there's also a character in the school of Athens, Diogenes, who's not far from the center, and he's indifferent but he's in the way. And so I find, I find this, this uh, representation of Diogenes really fascinating. And um, because Diogenes is basically showing people that all of the stuff that they think matters doesn't really. And he's still kind of involved in public life, right? That like Aiken said, denial and disruption. So he's kind of disrupting public life in his own way. There's even stories of him interacting with Plato and Aristotle where sometimes he gets the best of them. The most famous one is supposedly Plato was trying to figure out what it, how to define what it means to be a human, what sets us apart. One of the supposed definitions is uh, humans are featherless bipedal animals, right? Because there's not many animals that just walk on two legs. Uh, and of the ones that walk on two legs, those are mostly birds. So humans are bipedal, but they don't have feathers. And Diogenes could have gone and debated Plato in the academy. Instead, what he did was he plucked a chicken, he threw it into the lecture hall and said, behold, Plato's human, right? And that is just a beautiful counter argument and display. Supposedly Plato went back, revised his argument to include uh, broad or flat nails. <laughs> So like they, they couldn't have the talons of a bird. Um, luckily, Diogenes didn't like clip the talons off a bird or anything like that. That could have gone morbid. Uh, but he made his point, right? He made his point. The last thing that I'm going to talk about with respect to Diogenes is uh, his program of education um, can be seen in one particular anecdote. And that is he uh, notices that a young boy is drinking from a fountain but he's cupped his hands. And so he's drinking from his hands. 
And whenever Diogenes sees this, he realizes that inside of his bindle, he has a cup and he doesn't need it. Right? The whole point is to live that simple, self-sufficient, free life. And so he broke his cup. Um, and, and so what I, what I think this really shows is they're really focused on ethics and they're open to lessons and they're open to lessons from unlikely sources even. Uh, Diogenes learned this from a kid. Diogenes is, I think, probably the most important cynic and he's definitely the one who sets the movement in motion. And who does he learn from? This sage learns from a kid. And I think that's a really, really important thing and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this later. Okay, so the question here is, how should we describe him in ethical and social terms? And what I have here are a couple images that Mid Journey, the AI art program uh, generated. I, I gave it some, some key terms or whatever. But, but the idea here is, what, what do we make of this guy? He, he's doing these really brash, weird things, um, yet he seems to have a goal. It seems like it's bad, but I, I, don't, I don't know exactly. So let's turn to some philosophy and kind of see, it, see how philosophers might evaluate him. The first way is, uh, in fact, maybe, maybe I have most of these books on my desk right now. I can just, I can just show them so you can see them. Um, Sorry, I should have had this prepared. Uh, so Aaron James wrote this book here called Assholes. It got a lot of press. And uh, basically, this is his definition of an asshole. He tries to formally define it. He says, a person counts as an asshole when and only when he systematically allows himself to enjoy special advantages in interpersonal relations out of an entrenched sense of entitlement that immunizes him against the complaints of other people. A person counts as an asshole when and only when he systematically allows himself to enjoy special advantages in interpersonal relations out of an entrenched sense of entitlement that immunizes him against the complaints of others. So basically an asshole is someone who gets things or like, you know, uh, cuts in line or cuts you off in traffic or whatever else. They, they get advantages with respect to other people um, because they feel like they're entitled and they don't really care about other people. Like other people's complaints just aren't even led. They, 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 they don't hear the complaints. That's part of what it means to be an asshole. And I don't think that this describes Diogenes very well. Like, like what special advantages do they have? They're ascetic. You know, they live that disciplined life. They have basically no material possessions. Additionally, they're political outsiders. They don't want to be included. <laughs> they, they, they think that convention is a mistake. So I think it fails in that regard. Uh, an entrenched sense of entitlement, you know, to a certain extent, maybe the, the cynics are, are, are trying to get control or trying to get attention from you. But honestly, not, not that much. I mean, they're willing to work for it. They're adapting their message. They want to be self-sufficient and free. And moreover, they want you to be self-sufficient and free. And so I think that that really doesn't fit the entitlement criterion here. Um, are they immune to the complaints of others? So this one's a little bit, you know, if there is an aspect of being an asshole that's close to them, I think it might be this one. But I think it's that, you know, they're immune in the sense that you're not going to be able to ruin their day. Unless you point out like a way in which they generally, genuinely could be better. <laughs> like the little kid. Uh, that didn't ruin Diogenes' day, but he learned the lesson, right? But that same thing, the cup story, shows that he listens. He's not immune to the complaints of others. He's not immune to instruction from other people. So I just don't think that Diogenes, by any means, uh, can be considered an asshole, at least in the sense that Aaron James seems to talk about it. So there's another uh, book that, that's come out recently. This is by philosopher Eric Schwitzgabel. Um, he has uh, basically thousands of posts, I think, on his blog, The Splintered Mind, which you can find. And he revised some of them in this particular book. But you can see that the titular essay is A Theory of Jerks. And it's the first essay in the anthology. I think Schwitzgabel, even when I don't agree with him, understands stuff. Like he gets life, he gets people. And this jerk essay is really wonderful. Highly recommend it. Uh, but Schwitzgabel basically defines the jerk as the following. I submit that the unifying core, the essence of jerkitude in the moral sense is this. The jerk culpably fails 
So I'm not going to talk too much about that, but culpable failure would be basically someone who uh, doesn't just have like an intellectual disability or something like that, that would keep them from failing. They could do otherwise, but they don't. So the jerk culpably fails to appreciate the perspectives of others around him, treating them as tools to be manipulated or fools to be dealt with rather than as moral and epistemic peers. So basically, you don't understand the perspectives of other people. Uh, you just kind of use them. They're objects. The jerk himself is both intellectually and emotionally defective. And what he defectively uh, fails to appreciate is both the intellectual and emotional perspectives of the people around him. He can't appreciate how he might be wrong and others right about some matter of fact. And what other people want or value doesn't register as of interest to him, except derivatively upon his own interests. So basically, the, the jerk disregards other people. I don't think this fits. And the reason I don't think this fits is uh, the failure to see others as moral and epistemic peers just seems strange for the cynics. He does seem to have moral peers and moral peers, even with people who aren't philosophers necessarily. He learns from the boy, right? In the cup story, epistemic peers. I think he understands people and he understands how people understand themselves and understand the world. This is why he changes his methods throughout the different stories. He adopts his messages. I think what this shows is he's open to learning. He's open to communicating his messages. I, I, it's not, it's not failure of seeing other people. It's not just seeing them as objects. He understands them and he's trying to get them to see his thing. Now, the closest aspect of Schwitz Gable's essay that I think Diogenes might be uh, closest to is something like a moralistic jerk. You can think of a jerk who has this self-serving set of principles that they live their life by and they do everything that they can in light of that. They rationalize their actions. They rationalize, you know, their worldview, their perspective. But again, Diogenes, I don't, I don't think, I don't think that's him. Uh, I, I don't think his morality is necessarily self-serving. I mean, in a certain way, you know, like what, what is he getting out of it? And it comes back to that asceticism, him having very few material possessions, him not wanting political office, him not wanting political power or even really friends. What, what is, what is he gaining? Now, maybe there's a little bit of righteousness there, but, you know, that that's kind of one of the interesting things about morality in the sense that we can't just uh, half-heartedly, you know, really, I, I mean, in a deep sense, hold things, uh, you know, in practice. I'm sure a lot of people do. But but the point being, um, if we actually think that something is right, that's, that's what we're going to live by. So we can't fault him for that. So, I, you know, is he a jerk? I, I don't I don't think it fits again. Now, if it's close, it's maybe the subspecies that, that Schwitz Gable talks about with respect to the moralistic jerk, but I, I don't think that it fits. Okay, so what else uh, is in the philosophical literature? Well, uh, Nick Riggle, who writes a lot in the philosophy of art, but one of his first books was this called On Being Awesome, A Unified Theory of How Not to Suck. So... <laughs> Uh, Riggle is, is just an interesting dude. He's, he's funny. He has cool examples and you can even find an essay, I think in Aeon, um, that distills this particular book, but generally speaking, he's trying to talk about awesomeness and what he takes as an awesome person is someone who they basically look at a situation and they change the situation in a way that invites other people to be individuals and express themselves uh, in that by kind of like straying from the social script. So one of the, the central examples is a kid who's at a professional sports game. Um, I think Bon Jovi comes on over the loudspeakers. And you know, a lot of people just kind of laugh, maybe you do a little shimmy or something like that. But this kid jumped up, started lip, lip syncing, started like going, going wild, you know, whenever he's singing, going into the audience and other people were loving it and they were singing along with him. Uh, they, they just like, liked seeing this kid dance and lip sync and have some fun and it, and it brightened people's up. So he's deviating from the social script there. He's not doing what most people do and he's doing it in a way that 
encourages people to have fun and see each other as individuals, to see each other as human. Just that, that moment of recognition. Now, the reason why I spend some time talking about awesomeness is because sucky is the opposite of that. So here, because the, the question is, is Diogenes a sucky person? Riggle explains this. Sucking is, first and foremost, a matter of being able, but refusing to, take up social openings. Social openings are essentially opportunities for mutual uh, appreciation for individuality, allowing us to express, attribute, and cultivate individuality beyond whatever is required to play out the script written in the social code, or to carry on in our everyday habits and routines. People who suck in this sense refuse to play along even though they could. So he uses another example throughout the book of baristas at a cafe. And so the interaction is something like, I go to get coffee um, and the barista tells me two bucks for the coffee. And I say something like, well, that's a small price to play for becoming human, you know, uh, making a joke. And the idea would be, you know, the, the awesome barista would be like, uh, you know, glad to have you back, right? Uh, the sucky barista maybe would be something like, uh, okay, you know, whatever, man. Um, and, and that's, that's what's going on with the, the awesome versus the sucky person. The awesome person uses the social openings for deep recognition of, of who we are and being human. The sucky person could do that, but rejects it. Okay. So is Diogenes that? I, I don't think so. Um, if anything, the, 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 they're, they're trying to be awesome maybe, but the cynics create their own social openings. They deviate from the social script, right? They don't play along, but they're doing it because they want you to see that civilization and convention are shams. They're scams. They're ways that take you further away from being a self-sufficient, a free, a natural human person who could be living a good life, but you aren't because you buy into all of the lies of civilization. And they want you to be cynic and they want you to see the promise of cynic life. The, the aspect here is, that, that's also kind of interesting is Riggle is also very careful to say that you don't always have to be op open to people because there are bad people out there. So he says, for example, there's no awesome KKK members. KKK people are racist and awful and they aren't acknowledging the fundamental individuality or humanity of different people. So you don't have to go along with bad values. And I think the cynics here don't think that the values are good. And so I, I, don't, I don't know how to assess Diogenes with respect to this, this research in particular. It seems, it seems like they're not sucky because they're not shutting things down in a, in, a, in a certain way, although they are making protest to a lot of conventions. I think they're trying to be awesome in a certain way. Like they're, they're using social openings to invite us to become freer human beings. They want us to see the natural people that we can be. But because of the extremity of their position, right? That deep anti-materialism, that deep opposition to social entanglements, it doesn't work. A lot of people don't take them up on that. So that's, that's kind of a question. And in fact, whenever I presented this at Minnesota Duluth, uh, a, few of, a few of the questions were, were kind of directed toward this point in the sense that uh, were the cynics trying to get people to be like Diogenes and, and be as extreme, or were they just trying to get them to be more cynic? That is further away from what their lives were in the convention-based sense and more toward that natural sense. And that's a great question that I, that I can't go into here because I'm going to try and keep this relatively short. I'm trying to keep it under an hour, uh, but, but uh, it, it, I, think I find that a fascinating question. Okay, so the last thing that I'm going to use here just because I'm, you know, there are probably some other books that I, that I could use as well, is I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Amy Olberding's The Wrong of Rudeness. And here she uh, basically tries to defend an account of civility based on ancient Chinese philosophy and, uh, you know, trying to say why it's important and why, uh, because civility is so important, why it's an affront whenever people are rude. And, uh, she has just a fascinating writing style. I mean, she admits to being rude. She admits to liking to being rude. And I think that she, she pulls some really interesting insights in the book. Um, but generally speaking, here's, here's what she says about the rude person. Civility and good manners are behaviors that symbolically demonstrate pro-social values. 
These values include some of our most ambitious moral values, respect, consideration, and toleration, values we might consider the firmament of shared moral life with others. And it is typically these values we find violated in rudeness and incivility. Thus, for example, if we disagree politically, and I announce that this owes to your being simply too witted to discern the truth, I have violated these values. I decline to recognize your rational capacities to hold the views that you do, fail to consider your feelings upon being insulted, and evince an unwillingness to grant that intelligent people can hold different views. I am disrespectful, inconsiderate, and intolerant. Crucially, it is not simply that I believe you to be dull-witted, but that I say so. So what Olberding is getting at here is that one of the most important things that we can do in ethics and just social relationships is respect one another. That we can consider other people's perspectives. That we can be tolerant, at least of, you know, not horrible people, but we can be tolerant. Um, and what I do whenever I just think you're too stupid to understand the political truth and I say you're too stupid to understand the truth of the matter here is I'm going against those values that basically hold society together. I don't trust you. I don't respect you. I don't consider you. I don't think that you could be smart and hold the position that you do. I don't care about your emotions because I just outright say something that upsets you. Um, I basically just don't grant that someone could think differently than me. And that rudeness is, is, is basically a deep affront to what keeps us working together. C cities and civilizations are big and tough, you know? Uh, we need lots of different people who do lots of different things. Different ideas can help us to, to figure out really complex social issues. And when we're being rude, we basically threaten, potentially, that thing that helps us to work together in the first place. And so with Diogenes, I, 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 I'm not sure. If there's one of this, these like social vices that I'm going to talk about, and this is the last one that I think Diogenes is close to, it's probably this one. But it's tough to say. Because Olberding seems to think that, you know, rudeness is undermining the pro-social values. Basically those values that enable us to cooperate. Um, and I think that that's kind of true, but not, not so much. Because the cynics, you know... They're going to say that convention, civilization, maybe even including manners and civility are the things that restrict our freedom. We need to argue against those. Nature, that basic life, is what holds better relations. So I think in their own way, they are trying to encourage sociality. They're just trying to say that what you're doing is, is, is not it, right? Um, and as far as declining to recognize other people's rationality, their ability to think, or their feelings... I don't think that's the case. I mean, cynics are incredibly intentional. They adopt their messages to the audience. It's not, it's not simple refusal. It's not disregard. And, and I think the fascinating question that arises here with respect to Olberding and her conversation on rudeness is what if the point is rudeness? If the cynics are really trying to argue against things that we've heard all of our lives, right? Talese says the stuff that gets stamped with a smiley face. They need some way of shaking us out of indifference. It's really tough to just calmly talk someone out of something that has so much ubiquity, so much pervasiveness, something, something that we just don't challenge at all. Cynics need to disrupt, and it seems like rudeness might be a weapon. Uh, I, I could imagine, although I wonder, whether the cynics would, would would care about the rudeness. I mean, I think the cynics, first of all, would say the the social conventions that would deem something rude, those aren't really good conventions. And moreover, I'm going to do whatever I can to get you to feel the import of this message, how important it is, and to basically be disturbed by it because I want you to take this very seriously. They're trying to get your attention. Um, so just taking a little bit of a step back, what can we do with these general lessons about social vices? And I think one of the central lessons is a lot of these vices deal with the disregard of epistemic and moral peerhood. So we basically don't see other people as holding good beliefs, as having a good perspective, uh, as being people that are important. We disregard their emotions. We disregard kind of like their, their ability to save face, whatever else it is. And I think this is especially without good reason. So you have Riggle's caveat with respect to the racist. 
And I think uh, even though the scholars don't typically use this language um, in, in this literature, I think a lot of these social vices assume a type of hierarchy where the rude person or the asshole or the jerk or the sucky person holds themselves as superior or above uh, the other people. But I don't think any of this fits with the cynics. Uh, because again, the cynics adapt their lessons. They disrupt people. And I don't think they would do that if people were just objects or not worthy of consideration. You wouldn't adapt your message to someone you didn't think was like smart enough, right? Uh, you wouldn't learn from a, the, the boy cupping his hands if you thought that they, they weren't smart. They're, 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 they're living their values and they're open to other people teaching them and they're trying to find a way to effectively communicate with other people. And I think that ultimately what it comes down to is they struggle with you, right? They are practicing what they preach. Um, that integrity is super important, I, super important, I think, with respect to avoiding the criticisms here. They struggle with you and they struggle for you. They want you to be self-sufficient and free. They want you to live that natural life that they think is going to make you live better. So if, if we take a lot of the points of these social vices, these bad traits, maybe we can come up with some tips uh, for being a non-asshole cynic, being a non-jerk cynic, being a non-sucky cynic. And I think first and foremost, these good types of cynics are people who are going to treat people as moral and epistemic peers. You're going to consider them. You're going to learn from them. Uh, you aren't going to see yourself necessarily as above them. Now, you might see yourself as more uh, developed, I guess, in your sort of education or developed in your sense of morality, but you, again, are struggling with them. You're trying to live in the same world and you're trying to help them out. And number two is adapt the message to the audience slash be intentional. And, and I think the cynics do this really wonderfully. They, they, they don't just disregard people. Uh, they aren't not considering their emotions. In fact, they need to know their emotions because that's what's going to stir people out of indifference. Uh, also, I think that they are focusing on pro-social, ethical, or just values. Self-sufficiency, freedom, the natural life. They're trying to argue, they're trying to get people to move toward that. And lastly, I think the use of abrasive rhetoric and displays, they get used to accomplish more than just edginess or contrarianism. Now you can be edgy or contrarian in the way that, again, it's intentional. What's going to get under Alexander's skin? Uh, what's going to help me uh, get under these partygoers skin who are showing disregard of me? Um, how, how do I how do I get into their mindset, right? You can be controversial. You can be uh, edgy in certain ways, but it's never for edginess's sake. It's never for contrarianism's sake. It's for the sake of wider social values. And so the question here is, what, what, you know, what do we call this crude, upsetting, and yet a sort of advocacy program, advocating? Uh, what do we call this brand of cynicism? And I'm going to go with cynic fraternalism. Fraternity meaning like being siblings. Uh, maybe it's something like an older sibling dynamic. And, and I owe this point to Avery Kohler's, uh, who's another philosopher. And we were talking about this on social media. And uh, he made a joke of like, because I didn't say I was talking about Diogenes with Sinope. I just described this scenario. And he's like, sounds kind of like an older brother. And I think he was making a joke, but I think it's like a really really astute, really insightful joke. I think, uh, and ho hopefully this isn't just self-serving because I'm an older sibling, but the idea is that like a good older sibling is, is maybe going to be crude and upsetting, but they're ultimately going to try and help you to live better. So the cynic is probably going to be crude and upsetting, but they're probably going to try and help you to be more self-sufficient or free or live a more natural life. And the reason why I call this fraternalism is a sense that like, again, it's not that superior... Uh, relationship where you see yourself as above other people. It's more horizontal or non-hierarchical. You're siblings, right? <laughs> You're basically on the same level and it's good oriented. So here it's not paternalism uh, because paternalism is kind of like someone who's above you, right? But it's fraternalism because you are focused on trying to get people to be better. So that's why I'm, that's why I'm testing out uh, the idea of cynic fraternalism. And so whenever I'm looking at all these social vices and, and, and thinking up through these issues, I think that there's a way in which some people could just call the cynics toxic, but I think that would be missing uh, the point. Now, assholes are toxic, jerks are toxic in, in, in certain ways, rude people are toxic, but I don't think that that's 
That's the cynics. Toxic people poison the social relationships, right? They make people worse off. Whereas with the cynics, I think they're trying to make you better. Um, and so the word that I'm settling on here is catharsis. It's a Greek word. We use it in English too, but it's something like pur purgation. Uh, so, so a purgative where, where you're trying to get rid of something. So you could use catharsis in the context of uh, draining a wound, you know, if it's got too much pus inside of it, or uh, if you get sick to your stomach and you vomit, that's like an aspect of purging yourself that makes you feel better. And I think that describes cynicism, not only because it has the sort of like bodily uh, function, weird, disgusting stuff that some of the cynics do, but, but because I think it gets at like that short-term violation. If you drink a bitter medicine, it sucks. It, it's not a good experience. But the point is that a medicine will lead to long-term improvement. So here the cynics will violate some social norms. They will upset you, but it's for the long-term benefit of self or social improvement. Now, I think this raises probably one of the bigger questions that I don't have time to address here, but it's the idea of how weighty are these social norms, being an asshole, being a jerk, etc., in comparison to the ethical norms central to theories. So for example, uh, what's more important? that I avoid being a jerk or avoid being an asshole, uh, but maybe that compromises my self-sufficiency or my freedom? Or should we be maybe more freedom first, self-sufficiency first, whatever the central ethical values are first, even if that makes us jerks or assholes in a certain way? How do these, whenever these values conflict, which one wins out, right? Can they justly be violated, these social, these social considerations? Uh, it's not really something that's talked too much about in the literature, but I think it's being raised by, by, by this researcher whenever you're just kind of considering things. So future, future directions for this research, uh, I'm trying to figure a lot of stuff out. The first thing that I, I could imagine a critic kind of pressing me on is whether the cynics were actually so noble. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to say that they always have these pro-social things at their forefront. I'm not for sure. Diogenes of Sinope is the most difficult example because in a lot of ways, he's the most extreme. Sometimes uh, you might, maybe you want to separate the hard versus the soft cynics, the sort of extreme cynics versus the more reputable one. Now they're all ascetic. They all uh, issue um, material possessions and relationships, but they have various reputations. Diogenes being being the most abrasive one. Uh, but there were other cynics, Crates of Thebes and Demonax. Crates of Thebes uh, was known as the door opener, not just because he barged in kind of like Kramer, but because he was someone that people generally liked. He saved a man from killing himself. Um, so this is one of my favorite stories in ancient philosophy. Basically, there was this guy named Metricles. He was convinced that social reputation uh, and social standing was important for a good life because he was an Aristotelian. And he's giving this lecture and he lets out a fart and humiliates himself in front of a crowd of people. He decides he's going to kill himself. Um, people go and tell Crates about this. Crates goes to Metricles, tries to convince him not to kill himself. Crates is... is convinced he's going to starve himself to death. And then Crates starts to eat beans and fart uh, and talk. And I think metrically something about that, seeing that a philosopher could talk with him and not be ashamed about natural bodily functions, it, it, it registers in Metricles' brain and he decides not to kill himself. And in fact, he burns his notes, his Aristotelian notes, and becomes a cynic. Uh, there's another guy named Demonax. Demonax is, is celebrated by Lucian. And one of my favorite anecdotes with respect to this was Demonax was a, a, a cynic, um, but he was someone who could show up in an assembly. And if people were arguing about something that didn't matter, they would just look at him and basically shut up because they realized that they were wrong to be arguing about such, such stupid things. Uh, Demonax was also someone, he didn't own anything. He didn't have a house, but he would just walk into people's houses and eat dinner with them, uh, walk into ho people's houses and sleep on their couches or, or inside their house or whatever else. And people consider that great. Like there's, there's a mention of bakers uh, offering their wares to him for free because they, they considered it good luck if Demonax would take something from them. 
So there were cynics that were better regarded in certain ways. They lived the same sort of principles, but maybe they weren't as abrasive. Maybe we could do something similar with more or less effective things. Maybe we don't need to excuse all of the harshness of Diogenes. Maybe there are other means, which is kind of like the third question on this slide. I'll go a little out of order. Are there more effective means of achieving these results? That That's an open question. Uh, the second question, though, I think is, is probably like one of the more important ones, which is what separates toxic or abusive dynamics from what I think the cynics are doing. Uh, this is a little bit tougher. Now, I have a cursory answer in the slides, which is the cynics are promoting self-sufficiency and freedom. They make you better. They make a, a social community better. Uh, obviously, abusiveness makes people worse. It, it erodes community. So I think that's the general answer, but I think there's something deeper there. And then lastly, um, is the stuff that keeps the cynics from being assholes, their sort of asceticism, their commitment against material stuff, their commitment against uh, reputation, etc. that extreme opting out, is that also the stuff that sort of prevents the uptake here? And, and so I think that there's, there's something very interesting with respect to the social vices in the sense that what gives cynics a lot of, a lot of uh, leeway is that they are, or they have so much integrity they live their principles. They're really committed. But that commitment and how extreme their principles are, even though it keeps them from being just like the conventional jerk or asshole or rude person or sucky person, it's also kind of what prevents people from being completely on board. Now, what's interesting about Diogenes is people loved him. When he died, they mourned him. Uh, when he got beat up at a party once, he uh, put a sign around his neck of the name with the names of his assailants. And his assailants were shamed. Uh, when he died, they left like statues, uh, epigraphs, something along the lines of here lies Diogenes, uh, a man who made people freer. Um, they left little dogs because they, you know, they claimed the term dog. Uh, that's not something that you do for someone that you hate, right? Demonax was also deeply mourned. So it's, it's a weird thing in this, and, and hopefully I'm, I'm making sense as to why this is a weird philosophical puzzle. There seems to be, at least historically, these people who do really weird stuff, say really harsh things, do really harsh stuff, and yet they don't seem to be bad in a lot of the ways that we consider people bad. The jerk in the BMW who pulls up to Starbucks and parks in the handicapped spot so he can rush in and order a coffee and just scoff the whole time. Or the, you know, the, the person who cuts us off in traffic or whatever else just so that they can, they can, you know, go to their fancy, fancy job or whatever else. Like we're pretty comfortable calling these people jerks or assholes or whatever else it is. Um, uh, you know, racist uncle so-and-so. Uh, like we have terms for people like that. And it seems like they fit pretty well. But with some like these benevolent, right, these these uh, these sort of cooperative, I think, in certain ways, cynics are, are a different kind of species. And I'm not I'm not quite sure what 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 to call them. And that's 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 the that's the basic presentation. So uh, thank you for hanging out. Let me talk at you for about an hour. You got about 20 minutes of extra content compared to the lecture that I gave. But they got they got like, I think, close to an hour of Q&A. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to put them down in the comments. But thank you for your attention. Uh, shout out again to the University of Minnesota Duluth and Alexis Elder for inviting me to make this presentation and to deliver it up there. And uh, yeah, thank you again for listening.